All right, I think I got that beautiful bean footage rolling. Can everyone hear me? Can I get a couple more horns? Maybe a toot or two? Got, got some toots, okay. All right, I like those toots. Well, today, uh, hopefully we'll get another good word in. Hopefully we can uh, get something out of this today. I'm thankful everybody is here. I'm thankful we're able to have church any which way possible. Got Mr. Buddy here. He's going to sing a song. i uh, like to also wish my stepdad, Scott Anderson, a uh, happy birthday today. Uh, he's a mighty warrior. I don't believe he's scared of a thing. So I just wanted to wish him a happy birthday today. Uh, I'm hoping he'll see this a little bit later on when I put the video out. That being said, I'm going to hand off this microphone to Mr. Buddy, and uh, we're going to make him a superstar on YouTube today and put him all over the Internet.
kept your seat warm right there for you. I kept your seat warm right there for you. <laughs> well, I invited our district superintendent to watch it on YouTube and Facebook and all, so I just wanted to kind of give her a glimpse of what we got going on here. Got an FM transmission, keeping it safe during the COVID times. Everybody is social distancing and keeping healthy around here so we can talk about God. She was unable to be here today. She had a last minute commitment to take care of. See if I can do this without my glasses today. Maybe I can. If not, I'll just put them on. I want to thank everybody for coming out today. It's a beautiful day. It ain't too hot right now. So anyway, I hear we got some bad weather on the way, though a double hurricane coming south of us. So we need to pray about everyone in its paths. And hopefully it won't do too much damage, if any. So pray for the lives and all of everyone. That being said, we're going to start out with the Apostles' Creed, the traditional version. If you know it, feel free to recite it. Let us pray. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. The third day He arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, today we're going to revisit 1 Samuel 17, verses 32 through 49. Uh, we were just at a portion of this probably a few weeks ago, and uh, we're going to look at it from a different angle today. Now, we know this is about David and Goliath, and we all know the story. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and read, and uh, we'll, we'll take it from here. Starting with verse 32, David said to Saul, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, You're not able to go against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man, and he's been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he's defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was more, little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog? that you come at me with sticks. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and to the wild animals. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut, cut off your head. This very day I will give you the carcasses of the Philistine army, to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. 
All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give it all of it into your, our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him, reaching into his bag, taking out a stone. He slung it, and he struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. May the Lord add His blessing to the reading of that Scripture. Much of this has been preached on before by me and by others, but it's bearing a repetition today. Considering our times and this world who is slowly trying to take God out of everyone's lives. And we see where it's getting us. It's getting into chaotic times and many things are feeding off this chaos. So how many times do we read in our Bible about how fear has interfered with faith in the world of God's children? Fear kept the Israelites wandering in the desert for 40 years. Fear plunged Peter into a raging sea and caused him to deny Jesus not once, but three times. And it was a fear that held Saul back from the freedom of the Philistines. The children of Israel, they were paralyzed with fear because they had lost faith with their God. The story of David and Goliath is as familiar to us as the Wizard of Oz. It's a heroic tale of a boy coming of age and the weak overcoming the strong, or of good versus evil, if you will. But much more importantly, it's a story of how faith in God can overcome all obstacles. A simple shepherd boy had the solution to a problem that couldn't be solved by even King Saul. Israel had been held captive in an on-again, off-again situation since the days of Samson the judge. And now God's people were again at war with an enemy of gargantuan proportions. Fear had destroyed faith. And it took a child to show that through faith in God, all things are possible. This doesn't even make sense if you think about it from a human perspective. But God had a reason for it. Because He sent a boy to do a man's job. He had to do that in order to reveal that God is a source of all strength and not us as human beings ourselves. All of us face and experience fear in our lives. John Wesley, he could hardly have been called a faint-hearted stay-at-home, but there were times where even he lost his nerve. During one of Wesley's several Atlantic crossings, a frighteningly fierce storm broke out. It was pitching and tossing the ship that he was on around like a little bathtub toy. While Wesley and others clung to their bunks they, and hid, a community of Moravians traveling to their new homeland calmly gathered to hold their daily worship service and to sing praises to God through this storm. Watching these Moravians so, so apparently unperturbed by the howling winds and the crashing waves, Wesley realized he was witnessing a truly waterproof faith. And from that moment on, John Wesley prayed that God would give him the ability to likewise ride out life's storms with as much confidence to give him faith over fear. And that's pretty much the theme of today's sermon. So I want you to bear with me because I want you also thinking about today's times and what we're dealing with because a lot of people nowadays have a fear to even bring God up in society. So what made those Moravians so peaceful in the face of their tempest? It was the same trait that the disciples so woefully lacked in the walking on water gospel text, an unquenchable trust in Jesus Christ. And after stretching out his arms and still, stilling that storm, Jesus turned to his companions. He chastised them. He asked them, why are you so afraid? Don't you have any faith? Now what bothered Jesus was his disciples' lack of trust. They could see that He was in the boat with them, but they let their fear overtake them. In our day-to-day -day lives, when we face fear, we also face the question from Jesus, why are you so afraid? We need to look squarely at our fears to see what they disclose about our spiritual state. And I'm going to tell you, Jesus hit the nail on the head when He indicated that fear shows a lack of faith. And I believe nowadays that's what it shows as well. It don't stop there. God does not change for anything. We as human beings are the ones changing. 
The more we focus on Jesus' loving presence in our lives, the, the, and the less we zero in on the many storms we face in life, the less fear will possess us. Ralph Waldo Emerson once wrote, The wise man in a storm prays to God, not for safety from danger, but for deliverance from fear. It is a storm within which endangers him, not the storm without. We, we have to remember that regardless of what happens, God will be with us. The psalmist wrote, When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. And in his Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Denial of Death, Ernest Becker says that so many of the fears that we grapple with, fear of rejection, abandonment, failure, separation and loss, are but manifestations of the one ultimate fear, and that is the fear of death. Maybe he's right. So how do we overcome that fear? The answer is faith. It's the only antidote that will exercise the demons of fear that haunt us. In today's story, David also grappled with this fear of death. Can you imagine a little boy going up against a giant? He had to have been scared. He was a human being. But let's move on. He had to look, learn to depend on God's invisible presence during his shepherd watches. This knowledge that God was with him gave him confidence and strength to defeat his foes through faith in God. And death was no longer a fear for him. That can go for us as well. When we're constantly in the Word, then the Word is within us. We don't have anything to fear. But when we lose that, then we start to lose God. And then we start to have fear. And then we start to lose faith. And it's like a domino effect or a hurricane or a tornado in our lives, if you will. Think about it. There's a story of an old bishop, Warren Chandler, after whom the School of Theology at Emory University was named. As he lay on his deathbed, a friend asked as to whether or not he was afraid. He said, please tell me frankly, do you fear crossing over the river of death? Why should I, Chandler replied. I belong to a father who owns the land on both sides of the river. There's an old saying, and I love this one. Fear knocked at the door. Faith answered. No one was there. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. That is our great salvation, faith in His presence. And God cares if you're paralyzed by any fear in your life. He cares because that fear is intruding upon His destiny with you. As a human being, it gets in the way of what His intention and His purpose for your life is. It's perfect love that casts out fear at the foot of the cross and then, in faith, we can lean back into the arms of an ever-loving and gracious God. Then we, too, can echo the words of that old religious hymn. Many of us, if not all of us, have heard it. It's called, God will take care of you. He will take care of you. You know that one, Miss Sylvia? I know you do. You see, David faced a Goliath far greater than any earthly foe. It was called fear. He had it. But throughout his experience with God, getting him out of the situations with the wolves, with the bears, that created a faith within him and he knew he could count on God to take a small stone and aim it and hit directly where God wanted it to go. In our lives, Goliath, Goliath that big giant of an obstacle, it seems unbeatable, insurmountable. It seems impossible. Whatever that is, it may be personalized to just you because we all have different Goliaths in our lives. We all go through things in our lives, but it's not impossible. And I'm going to tell you, if you think it is, God loves it because He loves the impossible. He loves the underdog because He can overcome. He's not human. He is God. It's that one huge problem that we think just might destroy us. A difficulty so great that it has us wanting to give up. How many of us have been there? I'm going to raise my hand right now. Many times in my life, but I'm still here. I'm still standing. I've been knocked down, but I've gotten back up. All of us face the Goliath of fear in our lives. Maybe we've met him in the past. Or maybe Goliath is troubling us even right now. My goodness, you can turn on the news and get beat down for crying out loud. It's ridiculous. They don't want anything positive. They barely, if any, I don't even see none of them mentioning God in all this chaos. None of them. Because they don't want it. It don't get the ratings. It don't get the money. And that's the God they worship. And I absolutely despise it. It makes me sick. It could be that He's a 
vague, fearsome figure in our future. It could come in any direction in our lives. God wants us to confront our Goliaths today to deal with this enemy that robs us of our life, of our hope, of our joy. Because that's what God wants for us through Him, through His strength. We can't do it on our own. It takes God in our lives to overcome all these things. So if we pay close attention to the people around us, we'll discover that every one of us now or has in the past been living in Goliath's shadow. There's no doubt that much of the pain in our lives can be traced to the Goliath factor. We face the Goliath of fears in our lives because we have forgotten to have faith in God. We often see life as chaotic, as threatening and frightening, and it is from a human perspective. The Goliath factor is something within us that shrinks back in fear or anxiety when life's giant difficulties show up. We have to be like David. We have to stay in the Word. We have to let it strengthen us. Our faith in God is what matters. As Christians, we have to identify the Goliaths in our lives. We know that sometimes we have difficulty identifying the real issues that we fear, and that causes problems. Sometimes we get frustrated at work. And there's a fallout at home. We'll bring that work to home. Sometimes we'll argue with our spouse. Sometimes the children get scolded because we've had a bad day. It happens. We're human. Sometimes we just come in the door, we kick it in, and we kick the dog. We had a bad day. When we clearly identify what the true issue is that we're facing, we can address the problem and aim at the correct target like David did. We have to remember that every Goliath, think about it, every Goliath has an exposed forehead. It has a weakness. So we have to know where our strength comes from. We have to stay in the Word. We have to stay faithful to God because He is always faithful to us. Whether it's advice from our best friend or a book on how to do it in three easy steps or even 30 days, we have to remember this. God used what David already had. He had faith in His Heavenly Father. I took something that I've been listening to for a while. I've said it once and I'm going to say it again. It bears repeating as well. It fired me up. And I want to say it again. Sometimes I listen to different preachers. Sometimes I agree with them. Sometimes I disagree with them. And that's life. I'm sure they say the same thing about me. But I try to take the best pieces, the parts where God is saying, hey, this will preach. And I try to share them. Not everything is original. I don't see how it could be when it comes straight out of a book that's already been written a long time ago. All I can do is try to make it easy for people to understand the best I know how. So I just consider myself a filter and a vessel of God. And I am thankful for that blessing that everyone keeps coming to hear me. That being said, I heard something from Pastor John Hagee, and I want to take it, I want to share it with you right now. If what I just preached has left your mind and you can't remember that. I want this to reach you in your soul. So let me put the nail in this coffin real tight. God hates a coward. And this is not the time to be a coward. This is a time to be a warrior. Revelation 21.8 says, But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the lake of fire. God wrote that in the book. Got it right here. It's an amazing book. Kind of gives you instruction on life. I wish more people would be in it. It might help. So who needs the list of all of those? The cowardly. Look at all those who came before you in the faith. Moses with the shepherd's staff and based the royal court of Pharaoh. Pharaoh who is considered God on earth and has the greatest army of any nation ever assembled. And Moses looked Pharaoh in the eyes and said, Let my people go. Look at David, a little boy with a sling. We just talked about him. The giant Goliath is going against him and David says, You come against me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I'll give you the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. 
All those gathered here will know that it's not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give all of you into our hands. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane praying, and 500 Roman soldiers come from the Antonium Fortress to arrest one Jewish rabbi praying. 500 to arrest one. Think about it. 500 battle-ready Roman soldiers to arrest one Jewish rabbi who was praying peacefully. He had 12 sleeping disciples. They said, we seek Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus stood up and said, I am He. They were overcome and they fell on the ground like dead men. Jesus was not coward, not one bit. And I want to tell you something. Jesus lost His life at Calvary, but He didn't lose the fight. God will give you only what you're willing to fight for. And Satan attacks us because we are God's children and he hates all of God's children. Satan attacks us because we are the light of the world and he is the prince of darkness. Satan attacks us because we are the truth and he is the father of lies. Satan attacks us because we are soldiers of the cross and we are anointed. We have the Word of God. We have Jesus Christ. And we can take the sword of truth of God and crack the gates of hell. We're a threat to Satan. And when we keep getting up and getting up and getting up, he and every demon he controls quakes with fear. And for those of you who scream out the name of Christ and stand up for what you believe in, it's time to stop allowing Satan and our demons to ruin our lives. We have to put on the whole armor of God. We have to fight back. It has to be our time right now because it's slipping out of control. We have to quit allowing Satan to attack our health because the Bible says by his stripes we are healed. And I'm not always talking about physical health. I want to make that clear right now. Our spiritual health, that's what matters to God. We have to quit allowing Him to also attack us in the household. The Bible says God will rebuke the devourer for our sake. He will make them give it back to you sevenfold. So we have to stop allowing the devil to rob us of our peace. That's very important here. It's a distraction. It's a magic trick by the devil. Don't be fooled by it. Because Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. We have to stop allowing Satan to rob us of our joy. That's very important to God as well. Many of us walk around with sour faces. We've had that bad day before. But we've got to have faith. We've got to aim strong. We've got to hit the target. In His presence is the fullness of joy. If you want it, then you'll fight for it. I'm going to repeat it. If you want it, you're going to fight for it. You're going to stand up. You can't sit back and respect, expect results nowadays. There is no way it's going to happen. We have to put on the whole armor of God and stand beside the Lord and take the word of the wholeness of the Father and fight the good fight of faith. We have to resist the devil at every angle. And we all have our vices. We all have our weaknesses. And God knows every one of them, but He shows us the way out. We all have those thoughts. We are human beings. But we have to count on God for our strength. We have to resist the devil. He will flee from us in the name of Jesus Christ. We who carry this book right here, right here, just showed it to you. It's called the Holy Bible. It's an amazing book. Many of us have forgotten who He is. Many people in the world, in society right now, have forgotten. And they want us to forget. They want us to forget God. They don't want God in anything. They've already taken Him out of our schools. They've already taken them out of so many things. And look what's happening. Nothing good has come out of that. And they ain't going back. They're not teaching us about Him. In fact, we're the ones that they're coming after. We're sitting here, and I expect one day we're going to be attacked. Everything is backwards nowadays. He's the Son of God who looked at His crowd and He said, You are, the, are your father the devil. That's not very commonly preached around the world today. A lot of preachers don't even have the guts enough to talk about it. The fact is, God will give you what you're willing to fight for. This may be a war. maybe a spiritual war. God knows. But ultimately, in this war, we're either going to be cowards or we're going to be courageous. Some of us are courageous soldiers of the cross. And some of us in this world are cowardly. We only speak about it, but we're not going to show action. 
So we got to look out for our enemies because we're going to have some pushback. We're going to be attacked as Christians. We have to guard our families. We have to keep them in the Word. It's very important. So we have to be strong in the, in the Lord. We have to be strong in the Lord because this isn't our fight. This is God's fight. It's God's victory. It's already won. We can't do it on our own. It's all for God's glory. It's all for God's kingdom. It's all God's strength in us. We've got to keep the faith. We've got to stay in the Word. We've got to pull, put the whole armor of God. We've got to fight to win because we will win in the name of Jesus Christ. And God can give us the strength we need and He won't be exhausted. We may be. And when you are, that's when you've got to count on God to pick you up 